All right, so um, Beware, uh, building cross-platform applications in Python using Beware. Uh, Beware is a open source um, collection of tools. It's actually a suite of tools, um, a lot of little things designed to sort of go together. Um, the idea is that you can have one code base for your Python project and run it on multiple, multiple different applications, um, iOS or Macs or um, even uh, and making Android and, uh, and, and Macs uh, or, or an iPhone device work together. Um, the key idea is at the bottom, I don't know if you can see that, is that you would use that it um, employs native widgets, not, not themes that are meant to look like uh, whatever the target device is. So um, that, that's kind of the elevator pitch for it. Um, the, uh, in practice, it's a very new project. Um, so there's um, still some, some rough edges and um, also opportunities to contribute. So let's just get into some of it. So the Beware project can be found. It's got a home page, um, pybee.org. Can, can people see that? Um, if not, don't worry about it. We'll have these online, and the, um, you'll be able to uh, get to all these links for that. It's funded by uh, Dr. Russell Keith McGee. He's one of the core Django uh, developers. Um, and uh, kind of my inspiration for doing this talk was his, um, his talk at PyCon this past spring, um, which you can also see in, um, on YouTube. Um, in that, he walks through um, development of a kind of a chatbot app um, in just the course of a 30-minute presentation goes from creating a new app to having something that would actually be functional. So uh, that was pretty neat. Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're interested in getting started, would like to do a project, normally um, you would, you would um, probably want to get familiar with uh, virtual environments. On my, my PC, I use this virtual environment wrapper, um, and I've created one here for my um, project to live in. Um, and you simply have to do this command right here, pip install beware, and that gets it from uh, the Python package index. If you're not familiar with that, it's a resource of over, on, I think, 100,000 different uh, Python packages, extensions to the language. Beware is one of them collects it, downloads it with that one command and, and gets it installed on your PC and you can, you're off to the races. Um, it uses um, a project called Cookie Cutter. I don't know if any of you are familiar. Has anybody here used Cookie Cutter before? For, it's a, kind of a neat way for, um, if you find yourself doing the same code over and over, um, setting up directory structures, putting a, a boilerplate code, putting a license text code, this, you can set up a um, profile to do that, and Cookie Cutter is an application that will then build your, um, your, your little starting application for you. Um, and they've, Briefcase uses, well, Briefcase is one of the components of Beware that has a Cookie Cutter, um, a cookie cutter profile or template that will get you started for the, the correct license. So um, that's basically what I've done here. I've started a new project with a beware new command and um, runs through, um, asks a couple questions uh, to, to get you going. And it creates this uh, directory structure. In this case, it was a project called demo. Creates a git ignore and a um, place for your app to look. Most of the code, or at least your main code, will be in this app.py um, file. And that's where you start. And right out of the box, you can run it. Um, you can you just uh, navigate to the demo directory and uh, creates a Python module. So you run a Python -m, uh, demo, and demo being the name of the module that was set up. And it'll run an application that is fully functional, but doesn't actually do anything useful. It just brings up a window on the screen. Now, this is for my um, PC. Uh, if you did the same command on a Mac, you would see something that looks more like a, a, a default Mac screen, or in Windows it would be a GTK, or I mean, in Linux it would be a GTK uh, style um, basic menu. Um, so that's kind of how you would get started on a project. Um, underneath what's happened is, this is the code that was generated for you. There's a demo application. Um, it comes as a class. It also, it also supports, I've seen some of the applications um, uh, can also do a more functional style, but um, in the case of this one, it created a class called demo application and just 
uh, creates a main function that just invokes that or instantiates it. The last um, part of the uh, startup uh, method that's the one method of the demo application is this main window show and that will enter an event loop that um, will respond to your key clicks, moving the screen around and, and all, the, all the things that you would have to do to make a GUI application. Um, so it's, this is all generated for you. Basically you would start adding code in the middle here after the, the main box is, is created. Um, let's see. So assuming you've written some code, you may want to deploy it. You want to use it and you know, give it to a friend. Um, and what, what we did there by running it with the dash M was just running it on a local developer environment. Uh, the assumption is that when you give it to people, they don't necessarily want to have to have downloaded Python and installed libraries, even installed Beware. You would just want to give them an EXE or some kind of executable package that they could simply run. And that's where um, Briefcase comes in. This is the component of the Beware suite that's involved for packaging them up, putting them in a briefcase so you can take it to work. Um, in the case of, uh, let me see, what am I going to say about this? <laughs> um, the setup dot, the, one of the, the programs that was generated earlier was a setup.py, and what it allows you to do is um, target the different development environment, or the different target environments that you'd want to use, either iOS or Linux or, uh, or Windows, and uh, through a simple command, it will then generate a package. Now, in the case of um, Windows, it uses this Wix installer toolkit to create um, a setup.exe program, the traditional way of deploying software on the Windows system. And um, so all that code that was in the previous thing that you run, that I had run as, um, as a module, gets wrapped up and put into an installer that then I can give to a friend and they can, um, well, this is how I would, the command to do that would be the Python setup. So I'm invoking the setup command that got generated by um, the uh, briefcase code with the uh, Windows option and dash s just runs it. Once that's done, um, it'll create a number of uh, directories for me. Um, in, in, we'll actually create the installer. Now one of the things that happens, um, you can, um, Oh, actually, a little, a little aside here. If you if you were to run this today, or at least when I ran it last night, I, I saw some um, issues with uh, Toga as one of the other um, one of the other components, and I got a little bit of a warning message because the uh, development didn't quite match uh, the div the version of Co uh, Toga that I had downloaded didn't match the version that was deployed with um, setup. So what you may want to have to do is go through and. Um, update that. So that's a little bit of reference for you. Um, but once you've created that, that setup.exe, um, you would be able to give it to somebody and they would simply run it and they would see this application setup wizard and it would install it on their PC. So that's all you have to give them. You don't have to say go to python.com or python.org and, and download Python. Although you probably should. I mean, I'd encourage everybody to you know, promote Python in that way. But it's not absolutely necessary, and you can just, you don't have to jump over that hurdle to get your application in, in people's hands. Um, so then running the installer, it would just put um, a little program I wrote. In fact, this one's one of the sample code Fahrenheit to Celsius, and you'll see the little beware icon. It's sort of the default icon. And it just shows up in your start window, and that's all you have to do to run it. You don't have to start up some framework and then it's loaded through the framework or an IDE or anything like that. It just acts like um, OpenSCAD or, or my paint program, any, any of the others. It's, it's sort of a first class program within whatever the target environment is. Can I yeah, ask you a sure. If, let's say you're on your Windows machine, mm -hmm. can you build the, a Mac app from the Windows machine or do you have um, to run it from the I think in the case of the Mac one, it may be problematic. Um, I think you can. Um, I am not 100% sure of that because you may have to have some libraries that you would load through the Mac that may not be available. You may have to actually be running a, a version of the Mac OS to get that all linked properly. Okay. Um, I typically, 
I'm on the at least this uh, virtual machine from the target system when I've when I've done this. Um, but that's a good question. Um, so the converse can a Mac develop a Windows machine? I think so, but you would probably have to bring up a virtual environment and then uh, and do some of that from the the virtual environment. Uh, at least that's how I had done it in the past. The, I'm not sure if this is really a cross-compiler solution so much, is avail ability to take the same Python code base and then ultimately deploy it on these different systems. It's a big enough problem to do that, but that may be in the future. I think um, the, uh, that was the original goal, was to have a, is be the one IDE that you could use everywhere. I think just getting some of the widgets to work is a, is, is a, is a pretty big challenge and a, and a pretty good trick. Um, so the setup command targets a number of different, um, uh, has a number of uh, different build targets. For Linux, you would you know, give it the Linux command or a Linux option. Um, in Mac OS, there's a similar Mac OS. Android was a little bit problematic for me. Um, the, the, what's happened here is the Android Studio current versions are not um, compatible with the um, backend code that's being produced. So um, I was getting some Gradle errors. And this is a, a known problem. You can go to the website for the project and, and, and read some of, the, uh, uh, some of the details on that. Here's one of the emails. Um, basically, according to uh, Russell Keith McGee, the pro project founder, um, Android had made some changes to their tool chain, their tool chain and the Gradle files haven't been updated to follow suit. And there's also maybe a more subtle problem under the hood because um, the, um, the, the actual, in this little paragraph down here, they talk about VOC or VOC is, um, we'll get into that a little bit more, and that's the code generator for the Java uh, virtual machine is generating some code that the uh, current instances of the Java virtual machine don't like. So, so, so yeah, this is a work in progress. Um, you can uh, follow some of these links to see um, some possible workarounds for making the, uh, the Android solution work. Um, sorry, we don't really have that ready to show you. It's, um, this, this is an early days project. It's version you know, 0 0.1. So um, there are some sharp edges still. Um, iOS. Um, works, um, you need to have the iOS simulator. I think that goes to your question. Um, what would you, um, you, you need to be able to link to some of that. Similarly, the Android, you need to be able to deploy an Android sim, uh, simulator. I believe that's supported for both, um, for, for both Windows and Linux. So there is a bit of cross code operation going on there, but um, again, it's, it, it, it still needs some work. Um, Let's see, so, and then finally running in the browser. One of the target uh, platforms is Django, um, and I really had high hopes for making this work. Um, unfortunately, I was still getting some problems with that, and I um, was able to make some headway, um, but uh, it was still erroring out. So if I might be working on this, trying to bring this up a little bit later tonight. I know there's some Django experts in the audience, so if I could pick your brain, that would be awesome. <laughs> Uh, I believe it can. It's running um, native Python code when it once it gets in, invoked and in your um, for the deployed um, Windows, possibly not. Um, I'm not sure what debuggers you, you may have to do something special to get that to ship. Um, but when you run it just as a module, certainly you can because whatever whatever debugging would be available on your system as a, as a Python module should also be available there. Um, I, I would I would hope so, but I can't really say for sure because I haven't seen it in action yet. Um, that that would be um, I, I think that would be something you kind of need to do to as a practical matter to be able to debug that sort of thing. Um, you may actually have to go into the Python code and set the breakpoint there and have it. Um, but even then, I'm not sure that that would work because of the way it generates the the code targeting the Java virtual machine. So that, that could be a, a future enhancement. I'm, I, I just don't know. 
So we kind of talked about that little um, app that pretty much does nothing, not even Hello World. Um, I did find this little bit more useful app, uh, Travel Tips, that has been deployed across a, a few different platforms, and I thought that was kind of neat to show. Um, so you can download the code for this. Um, this, is, this is Python code. It's um, uh, Freakboy3742 is Russell Keith McGee. So this is his app. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like on Windows. It's basically just a little thing you can put in an amount in a local currency and have it converted to a different uh, currency. So if you're traveling, if you're from Australia and you're traveling in the U.S. and you want to set a tip for uh, a $13 lunch bill, you can, you know, figure out what the correct tip would be for that. Um, and that's great if you have a Windows laptop. You may have a Linux laptop. You can run the same piece of code for that, and it and it looks uh, again. It's the uh, native GTK. Um, these were weren't emulated. These are actually using the GTK widgets that are available on my system in this case. Um, this is what it looks like on my wife's Mac. I, I'd have brought it today, but it's um, currently um, in the death throes. It's six-year-old Mac, and it's it's gone vintage. So uh, I don't think anything can be done other than get the files off of it. Um, but it, it will also run on iOS, and so this is what it looks like uh, running on my iPhone. Um, actually, this is what it looks like before it's on my iPhone. It's you, this is a uh, a um, app you can get in the Apple App Store, and um, once you load it, there's a. Uh, I'll just show you the screen. There it is on my um, on, on my background, and when it starts up, it says "Made with Beware," and as it comes up, you see that same little um, little little piece of sample code. That's even um, interesting. He's left some space at the bottom here, so he can bring up the native um, Apple keypad. Similarly, if he goes to these little ones for selecting US dollars or Australian dollars, they'll bring up the little spinner um, tool that, that you're familiar with. That, that's all been hooked into the native Apple um, program. And it does something, a uh, similar <coughs> drop down menu on um, the uh, GTK and the other desktops. So um, that kind of seems like magic to me. I was like, when I first saw that, well, how, how does it do that? And um, the, the three main parts it uses are these um, other components from the Beware project that are um, sort of bridging the gaps between Python and these, uh, these, different, um, these different platforms. So Rubicon is probably the most straightforward. Of it. It's uh, 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 basically a bridge library for uh, Python to Objective-C because the, uh, so you can access the um, Objective-C APIs that you're going to find in the um, the Mac OS systems. Um, VOC is a little bit um, more, um, I mentioned this a couple times, it basically generates bytecode instead of targeting the Python uh, virtual machine. It um, targets the Java virtual machine because uh, JVMs are pretty much, uh, can be assumed to be present on um, Android devices and on, um, it pretty, well, it, it's needed for Android basically. Uh, Batavia is another one kind of interesting, and this is the approach for the web. And it's, um, the idea here is that um, it's a JavaScript implementation of the C Python virtual machine. So you take that same Python bytecode, and instead of executing it on C Python, it's um, one written in a language that would be expected to be available in the web environment. Uh, one approach could possibly be to move that to the transpiler model, more like the uh, VOC approach, but um, I'm not sure if they're actually talking about that. I just thought it was kind of interesting. I had never heard of WebAssembly until I came across that. So there's a link in case you'd like to see more. The idea there is that um, treating JavaScript as an assembly language for the web and writing um, programs that generate that so that you don't have to write JavaScript yourself, you would use some tool. In this case, it would be a tool that translates your Python code to, uh, to that, if, if that ever came to pass. So, um, so a little more details about Rubicon. Since you're typically going to find Objective-C, the problem here is that it's a statically typed language, and with by, with um, dy uh, Python's dynamically typed language, you sometimes have to. It's a similar problem, I believe, to what you would have with C uh, C++. Um, they have to be bound to specific uh, function um, uh, function signatures. And there's some little more detail on what, what's actually going on under the hood at the Rubicon page. 
Um, we got Route Gun, it's a bridge, so Caesar crossed the crossed the bridge over the Rubicon River when he was invading Rome, and so they, they, there's a lot of um, B and or um, uh, these uh, these kind of classical um, puns going on here in this program. I thought they were kind of cute. Um, VOC is a, um, a, the, again it's a Java virtual machine. Java is also an island in the Far East, and the VOC is the Dutch East Indies company. So. Um, but probably of more interest to us is the idea that this is um, some, some use of some fairly uh, sophisticated computer science ideas of the, the abstract, abstract system, uh, abstract, I can't even say it, abstract syntax trees. Um, so these objects that are generated by this, the Python C compiler, just when you're going to run your everyday code, um, he's digging into that, pulling those parts out, and using those to generate a different um, uh, uh, bytecodes. So at this point, this is one of the intermediate steps in generating bytecodes that run on the Python, the C Python virtual machine. Um, so it, it, another thing that um, this kind of brings to um, mind is that the project is, uh, is pretty much only available on Python 3. Some of these tools and techniques just wouldn't be available as a practical matter on Python 2, so it's um, pretty much a, a, a requirement that you use Python 3 for, um, for, for doing your development. And then finally, Python in the browser, as I said before, um, using uh, JavaScript is, a, is, a, is the um, language of the web, so implementing the C, uh, a Python uh, bytecode interpreter there lets you run, in, in some sense, Python code in, in the web. Now there's some other, to do that, they, use, they have it wrapped in a Django app, so there's a lot of infrastructure that goes around that, but its core is, that's how they're making the code run. How are we doing? Oh, oh, oh sorry, that's okay. I should get that. So I've kind of talked about some of the um, underlying technologies, some of the over, um, so, some of the, uh, the, um, things that the nuts and bolts of making these different languages. This is what it might look like, the developer experience. Now, it, there's a lot of different moving parts with the Beware project. Probably the one that you as a developer would interact with most is the one called Toga. That's a little icon for the, um, for, for the, the, the Toga project, or a little mascot for the Toga project. And it's the component that you would use to, to implement, to, um, uh, work with the widgets that you're going to put thing, uh, components up on your application for your, um, uh, for your buttons and, and what have you. So going back to that, um, that application uh, was generated by the briefcase, we're going to do the simplest thing possible here and it's basically just add a label and fix the static text label um, to, to the box. And once that's been done, we'll see how a world appear in the um, on that same screen. So, not terribly interesting, but at least it's a start. Um, once um, you've, well, it's, the, the, the Toga model for programming, is, it says here, it's kind of like the DOM model, or a document object model for um, laying out your window. And basically you have these um, boxes that can nest inside other boxes, and these boxes contain other widgets such as um, text controls and um, buttons and things that you would normally find in a graphical user interface. So here's an example of how we've done a little bit, add, add a little bit more to this. I'm going to add a grid of, <coughs> of, of buttons. It might be helpful to see where I'm going with this. So I'm going to take that Hello World application and, row f and, and add uh, five rows of four buttons. I just want to make a, a, a grid of um, buttons and I'm going to hook those up to some other Python functions. So what that would look like in code would be, um, I've just added a loop kind of naively defined. Um, I'm going to uh, start with a counter variable that will just give me a serial number for each one of the boxes. I create a, an, an object to hold them and call the grid box. And inside that, um, these, the, the outer loop, I'm going to define a box, one box to hold each row. So that's the, um, see the, um, the, the, so we have the main box, the grid box is the um, second level, and then inside of that are the five row boxes. 
and each one of these row boxes will then have four buttons in it. Um, in the, and that's the center loop here where I go from one to four, I've added the buttons with a F string to, um, to uh, put a label on them based on this count value that's just incrementing. And uh, it's kind of just a, a real simple code just to show programmatically what it what might look like to, uh, to generate some, some things for your, uh, for your, your, your um, application. Well, the Python code, I believe, let's see if I got my story straight here, is um, the, the dots, um, .pyc files that are the bytecode get, get bundled up with, um, I believe, a copy of the Python interpreter or whatever other libraries that would be in, invoked. And, and so that's what ends up running on your native uh, platform. So on platforms that support C Python, that's what you would ship. So um, all, the, all the desktop applications um, the deployed package would have a copy of Python with them. Um, is this deployment package, is this like an installer that's going to install a bunch of other stuff, or is it a standalone EXE that I can just put on my, put on my machine? And yeah, no, it's an installer package. Okay. No, um, right. I, I may have misspoke there. I think um, there, there may be a way to, um, I should probably get back to you on that, because there may be a way to just take the, the EXE part of that separate from the installer. I think that's actually how um, the Linux solution would work, and the, um, possibly the Mac as well. But I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what the uh, directory tree that came out of that looked like. We can we can try that out afterwards and see if we can make that work. So let me see. Um, so along with that, to get you started in the code, the, the um, there's some uh, code examples included with Toga, um, and most mostly they uh, focus on a specific widget. There's a link to that part of the um, project in GitHub. But here's just the, the overall list of them. Um, Beliza is the, um, is the PyCon walkthrough. Um, you might spot some other things in here that are just useful, um, just some useful tools for creating a, um, a graphical user interface style application. Um, a couple of the um, ones that I, I thought were uh, important to highlight, um, we'll show in the, in the next part. Um, this is uh, the, the buttons example. It just shows some different style buttons um, with different fancy colors and placed various um, different sizes and move them around the screen. Now, <clears throat> again, these are um, using a screen coordinate system that gets mapped to something that will be a screen coordinate system that makes sense on, the, um, on, on whatever your target app platform is. So if you put the button way off in space and you have a limited size screen handheld device, you may not be able to see it. Um, so you have to have some knowledge of what your, what your target is, um, but um, in the, the fact that you can do it at all, I think is kind of neat. <laughs> so uh, let's go on to the next. Um, switches are another handy thing. You can have check boxes that um, kind of Boolean or, or um, multi-state logic. Um, they can also be organized as uh, like radio style buttons. You click one and the others go off. This is all old hat for people that have done like GUI development before, right? Has, has anybody here actually done GUI development or written a GUI app? Okay, so so, so it's it maybe may new for some people in the audience if you haven't tried this before. Uh, one of the other things that I thought was kind of neat and one of my pet peeves of when I encounter an application is that why couldn't it just use the file open dialog that I'm used to, that I use from my, my, my file browser. That, that, that kind of drives me crazy. So I was really happy to see that um, when you bring up uh, the, the option to bring up a, a, um, uh, a file open dialog, it invokes, in the case of Windows, the, the native file open uh, dialog uses the operating system. It does uh, something similar for, um, or the converse, 
uh, the corresponding thing, I should say, for uh, Linux and GTK. Um, now, interesting, you don't really have necessarily a concept of a file system on a handheld device, so that wouldn't be implemented, and you would get a warning if you tried to do that. So again, you do have to have some knowledge of what your um, end product is going to be and where it's going to be used, um, but you, again, can still just do this through Python when, you're, when you need to. Oh, file system, yeah, yeah. So, so, you, so, well, yeah, I mean, you may, so you may have to, we'll have to bring that one up. We'll have to get Android working so we can see what that looks like. Yeah, they just don't have, like, a native widget. Yeah, so that would be the case where you'd have to write your own. You'd have to put together the buttons and a tree view of, of things to do all that. But so, so the bad news of all this, and I've kind of alluded to some of this, is this is a really new project, that 0.1.1. .1 .1, yeah, there's some sharp edges, things will break. Um, I don't know if I would use this for production code yet. But um, not to run it down too much, I think these are opportunities if you've ever wanted to contribute to an open source project. Um, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a lot of opportunities to, um, to, to, to help out. But as I said, you know, it's <laughs> hand and eye protection are uh, required. So um, I brought my, my beekeeping veil to uh, Python just to yeah, but it was, um, <laughs> and that's Russell. The, and that's I'm, I'm sorry to jump by him. That, that's Russell, Russell Keith McGee, the, um, the the founder of the project. And um, this was at the sprints. I don't know if anybody here. I know a couple of you have been to PyCon. Um, the um, following the main uh, speaker events, the the uh, few days after, they have what's called code sprints where. Um, different um, people bring their projects. The organizers provide space um, for um, uh, people to gather much like this and, and work on some open source project. And one of the, um, the ones that I, I, uh, I jumped in on was the, the Beware project, so I got a chance to fix a few bugs and uh, meet some of the, the, the core developers there. And one of the things that's kind of neat, they are very welcoming, is if you make a commit, um, They'll, uh, you, you get a, one of these challenge coins as sort of an incentive to um, get people to, to help out the project. Um, there's, uh, I was thinking about this, there's kind of three, three or four places where you could start as a new developer to maybe make a contribution. Uh, the first is um, the documentation. Uh, things are moving pretty fast, so some of the web pages need to be brought in sync with, um, with the current state of, uh, of some of the of the um, the example code and how to get how to get started, um, and there's also a need for uh, internationalization or localization of some of these so different languages people can can, can access them. And some of the other ones are um, a little bit uh, closely. Some of these widgets aren't available on all platforms. So if you find um, say a, a button widget doesn't work all the same all the ways that you would need it to on your platform. You could go into the um, Toga libraries and maybe add an extension for that. Uh, buttons are actually pretty a bad example. They're pretty well uh, uh, covered. With, with question? Yes. Yeah, so if you want to use as a widget like a camera or a speaker, like a microphone, or 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 a the, the first thing you need to think about is that that, um, that, that asset or that, that interface may not be available on all devices. So you would have to um, start by kind of working up, writing a generic version of that that will basically just be a placeholder. So even if the application, if the platform didn't have a camera or a microphone, it would still, it wouldn't just crash because of uh, a missing piece of code. Then you would implement it for uh, uh, the, the application that you're interested in um, and, and write tests to, to kind of make sure that that's all covered. Um, and, and actually tests are one of the areas that they encourage people to, um, to contribute to. They've actually got pretty good coverage. Um, I think it was about 90, 95% from the, uh, when I saw it last. But there are some places where the tests are there, but maybe they don't really exercise the, um, the, the component and, um, as much as they could. Um, so that, that's one place for, uh, for, for help. And then um, 
I think probably the most um, probably the most advanced level of um, support that I've kind of seen is these things that are just um, where you would need specific domain knowledge, like to bring up um, to, to to fix a problem with the Android um, that mentioned a few slides ago. You may need to have some specific Java experience to be able to help out with that. Um, so, but there. Um, hey, you had a question? Did you, um, if someone wants to make a, a report, like maybe they have a couple of buttons or selection things, yeah. then there's a report. Is there good support for that across the platforms if you can generate a few column report in Python yeah. or HTML? Um, um, will that go across or not? Is that not quite there? No, um, I, I think the, the depending on how you would. Um, you, what, what your use case is. If it was a report that got displayed on the web, um, that would probably be the, the, the web interface um, or the Django app. Um, so it's, it's, it's there, but currently it's, it's got some problems, or at least I had some problems running it. On the other hand, if it was just generating a text file that was a report, you could always do that based on um, just your, your Python code. So again, you could bring it up in the Python, um, test it on your computer, and with whatever interface device or interface options or widgets you would need to, um, to create that, and then generate a file, kind of how I would think of it, and um, then try and deploy that in um, some other target system. Say if you were working on a PC, but you knew your customer was going to have a Mac or would like to use, prefer to use a Mac, then you could get it working on your PC and then um, find a Mac, compile it, and then deploy it that way. Does that answer your question? Sorry, yeah. Okay. Um, we're just about at the end, actually. Um, there was, um, I just uh, included some links to different parts of the project, um, so um, in case you want to find more. These should be available on the, um, the, the slides will be available on the, the um, Python Frederick um, page. So um, I checked most of these out. I believe this page also works. Um, and um, the, a few of the other um, things that I found interesting were some of the videos on uh, writing a transpiler. Um, this was the going back to the VOC um, approach for getting Java to run um, Python code. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. And then Beliza was a code walkthrough from this past PyCon. And um, again, I just thought this WebAssembly was kind of a neat concept, so I included a uh, uh, a, uh, a link to that as well. Is that a Gary Barker? Oh. I think it is. Yeah, that next sounds familiar. So again, um, you know, full credit to uh, Russell Keith McGee. He wrote and, and organized most of this. I'm basically here doing a, a trip report or a book report of um, what, what I've uh, done and what, what I've um, found interesting about it. And uh, thanks for watching. That's all I've got for you. Uh, any other questions? I actually have one question. Would sure. you say that uh, entry level, um, that this would be easier than something like Tkinter? Uh, like, uh, like would Tkinter? Um, I think it's probably at about the same level of that, although I think Tkinter is probably a little more um, polished. Um, I think these ones look a little bit nicer because um, um, Tkinter, um, I believe they've got their own kind of um, inter looking widgets. Um, then the advantage of that is it's shipped with Python, so you can use it right out of the box. Uh, they're actually not that different. If you've put a few buttons on a screen and, and use the grid layout, I think you, um, it, it's a different approach that's used here, but um, it's, I don't think it's a terribly hard leap to make, especially if you've done some web programming where you've worked with a document object model. Um, I'd say they're about the same, but I think the Kenter is a little bit more stable. So that might, on that basis, it might be a better place to start. So, sure. Okay, other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>